So tell us why you left the New York Times. Why I or left the New York Times? Or maybe I should Times. ask you, why did you ever go there? <laughs> <laughs> Even better. Um, I have a story about that, too. Mm -hmm. I was editor of the Texas Observer, and I had been asked to join the New York Times and, and was in great hesitation about it. And uh, one night, Johnny Apple, the Times' ace political reporter, who is notorious in our business for uh, having an ego actually as large as his talent, um, <laughs> took the Texas Observer editors out to dinner, Kane Northcott and I, uh, to find out what all seven liberals in Texas thought of things at that time. <laughs> and Johnny was holding forth, as Johnny often does, telling one story after another uh, about what a fabulous writer, reporter he was and how many famous <laughs> people he knew. And uh, finally he started saying, you've got to come to the Times, and I said, yeah, I don't know, Johnny. There are so many cultural differences. Apple said, cultural differences? What cultural differences? And Kay Northcott, who is real tiny but real tough, said very quietly, well, for one thing, Mr. Apple, consider it very bad form to drop names. <laughs> And Johnny, without hesitating, said, just last week, Stuart Symington was saying something just like that to me. <laughs> just wonderful. Um, I came to leave the New York Times because I was um, Rocky Mountain Bureau Chief for the Times. I was the chief and the bureau. <laughs> and I had uh, been out in the Mountain West for three years, having a wonderful time, covering all the mountain states from the Canadian to the Mexican border. I loved it. Loved it. A great way to work for the New York Times is to be at least a thousand miles away from New York. Um, and I went to uh, write about a um, community event in a small town in New Mexico. The Times loves feature stories about life in the West. Um, <laughs> And um, everybody in this little town um, in New Mexico raises chickens. And they all get together and uh, once a year, and they start around the sun up, and they play country music, and they drink beer all day long. And they kill the chickens, and they pluck the chickens, and they dress the chickens. And at the end of the day, everybody's just high and happy, and it's got a whole bunch of real nice dressed chickens to take home and pop into the freezer. Now, you see what you have here. Here's your modern-day version of the barn raising, right? <laughs> The old Western tradition of neighbor helping neighbor. So that was the premise of my story. Now, I did, in fact, in the course of writing this story for the New York Times, refer to the event as a gang pluck. <laughs> but I would it recorded that I never expected that line to get into the newspaper. <laughs> I had put it in there merely to amuse the guys on the copy desk and give them something to chuckle over before they took it out. This was a regular service of my writing at the New York Times, I might add. <laughs> and in fact, the line never did appear in the New York Times, but word of it got around the newsroom and reached the ears of a Rosenthal. <laughs> And I was abruptly recalled from the Mountain West, sort of like a defective automobile, and told him to <laughs> report to New York immediately for reassignment. Went in to visit with Mr. Rosenthal, and he thanked me for having worked my ass off for three years, and then said, but Molly, there is this tendency you have to stick your thumb in the eye of the New York Times. <laughs> now, this is not the first time Abe and I had had this discussion. <laughs> and I said, no, Abe, actually, it's not. And in fact, I've never tried to flout the conventions of the New York Times. I have simply never understood where you people draw the line. And when it is pointed out to me that the line is there, my honest reaction is, Jesus, you've got to be kidding. <laughs> We refought a number of uh, old fights. There was a time I said that, uh, in a feature story from Mount West, that a fellow had a beer gut that belonged in the Smithsonian. <laughs> Turned up the next day in the New York Times as a man with a protuberant abdomen, <laughs> which I felt did not have the same ring. <laughs> On another occasion, also writing the feature story from Mount West, I said the fellow squawked like a $2 fiddle. For reasons I shall never understand, it was changed to an inexpensive musical instrument. <laughs> mm. 
to write for that newspaper is to die the death of a thousand cuts. At any rate, <laughs> finally Mr. Rosenthal got to the root of his ire. He said, but you wrote that story about that community chicken slaughter out west. I said, yes, sir, I did. He said, you tried to call it a game flock. <laughs> I said, well, Abe, I thought it was a good line. He said, gang pluck. <laughs> I said, well, Abe, it's a play on words. <laughs> he said, gang pluck. <laughs> you, that is a play on gang fuck. You were trying to make our readers think of the word fuck. <laughs> Which they never do. And I said, damn, Abe, you are a hard man to fool. <laughs> That's how I like <laughs> so, so, did you quit right there? Yeah. No, actually, I, I, I waited until I had another job offer. <laughs> <laughs> You're no fool. Do they ever try to get you back? Mm-mm. <laughs> I have been, that my byline has been gradually rehabilitated over the years, though. It's like one of those Chinese people who has erred politically. I became a non-person for all the time. My friends of the Times would sort of sneak me into the back of the book review from time to time. And now, I'm, now I've been fully rehabilitated and, and uh, have actually been on the op-ed page. <laughs> you enjoy Jack? <laughs> <laughs> it's all coming together. <laughs> she said, I said I'd been on the op-ed page, and she said, you and Georgette. <laughs> so recently you had a, a newspaper fold underneath you. Yeah. Is this yeah. your fault? Love a Times Herald. It's my fault. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, the uh, Dallas Times Herald, my late lamented newspaper, um, was, I think, in many ways a classic victim of the 80s. It was um, bought twice in the 1980s by, um, oh, I'll just go ahead and say sleazy entrepreneurs um, <laughs> who uh, were leveraged up to their eyeballs. And every nickel that newspaper made for the last six years of its existence went to pay off the interest on the debts they incurred in buying it. Of course, you don't put money back into a newspaper. It is a death sentence. It was actually making money the day it died. It was bought by the Dallas Morning News, the... Uh, very conservative right-wing paper across town. They bought it on a Thursday. They got Justice Department approval to kill it on a Friday, and they killed it that Sunday. As my friend Jim Henderson said, sons of bitches, wouldn't you know they do this on a day when the liquor stores are closed? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I hear you were deeply depressed at the prospect of, of having no column to fill. Tell me why that, why is that important? Well, I, I, a steady income is not a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't, maybe the there is something thing. addictive about having a forum in which to sound off. I sometimes think that a large part of the frustration of the citizenry comes from lack of access to public forums.